think we've left the trenches long ago before they came into <laughs> to pollute the trenches. We had a very we had to clean our trenches. Um, and they still try in our trenches we could drag away all kinds of characters and leave us go and the rest of them. There are trenches where you know structural adjustment of Babangida. Unfortunately now we have in the same trend those who actually now go to the ministers and the rest of them and collect money in order to patronize them rather than chasing their corrupt ones outside. So I, I really want to thank the opportunity for the opportunity. When he invited me, he said, will you be available? And uh, there are cabals and cabals. We do know that in some of the cabals, when your colleague calls you, he's actually commanding you, he's not asking for your opinion. I knew this was quite crowded for me, but I knew I must be here. And I'm already reading, uh, you know, reaping the benefits of uh, being obedient. I've been looking for the full number of Reverend uh, Wilson Okoye for some years. And as I came in, I saw him and I said, this is the first benefit. Um, and, and I think I need to say this. I don't want to embarrass you why I needed his phone call. We met, and you won't remember, in a very unusual situation. And I, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I think it's important when you talk about leadership. Maybe you ever be able to remember. Maybe that was not your interpretation, but that was my interpretation of what happened that day. On a Tuesday some years back, I think in 2006, I was chairing the Presidential Committee on Prison Reforms. And then somewhere in Enugu, there was killing of five prisoners, execution. And I became worried that people would think that was uh, an interim report that was being acted upon. So we booked an appointment to see the president, then President Thomas and John. On that Tuesday, we couldn't see him. And the security people, it was around 11 p.m. He said, come back tomorrow, Wednesday, which is, uh, and join the prayer group, which happened to be Wednesday. Now we begin to remember the event of the day. It turned out later in the afternoon, that was the day that Oko Joy Wella was moved from finance to, to foreign affairs. We went that morning, and uh, OBJ was in a short uh, pant and then a t-shirt. And Reverend Okoye started his, uh, I don't know what he does on other days. I don't know whether that day was peculiar. And he, and he was saying we should search our hearts, and he was talking to them, wasn't part of them, I was only bringing crash. <laughs> he said they should, they should actually search their minds, that they are Christians, they are Muslims, the Christians go uh, and they take Holy Communion. But what they do thereafter does not correspond to what they claim to be, and even the activities they undertake, including taking Holy Communion. If you remember, OBJ just Back the table in front of you and say, let us pray. <laughs> and he took over the prayer. And that was the end of that morning service. I, I, I went away with the crisis we have of leaders not wanting to hear the truth. I, I don't think, like I said, it might be my right or wrong interpretation. I think he knew where he was going. And it was not comfortable. And it had to be stopped. Since that time, for the courage that day, each time I said, I said, I met somebody who was very courageous right in front of power. Even when power tried to stop me. Since that time, that was 2006, we got met up in this morning. Like I said, I tried to get his number on occasion when there is some disaster. Because the church is a disaster today. Except anybody who is doing the ostrich. It's occasionally I tried to call him and then I didn't have his number. And I, and I just gave up. So, when we talk about leadership, and as Dayo Laide said, it is people intervening in an ongoing decay and turning the tide in a different way. Samson, who again I've not seen for a fairly long time, mentioned the Conrad, and then of course the exceptional role he played in reversing the Hitler mentality in Germany. So, graduates, you are graduating, and I think the most important thing is. Can you stand alone where the crowd is asking you to join the tide? And for me, that is the, the leadership. Being able to stand alone. Being able to stand alone. 
and that is very important. If you are not able to stand alone, you will never have an appropriate vision. You will never have an appropriate vision. Again, I'm being harassed here, they say 45 minutes. I won't spend 45 minutes, I've learned a lot of lessons. Psychology says, the first 15 minutes people listen to you. The next 20 minutes, at another 5 minutes, they, you know, they tolerate you. If you stay more than 25 minutes, they start talking to themselves. <laughs> so, I always ask pastors who have uh, revelations and motivation, don't spend more than 30 minutes, because after that you've lost your members. So I, I, tr I will try to, I have a the paper, that's why the paper is written, so I'm not going to read it. I'm going to read the introduction and that will have summarized what I need to say. After the introduction, I'm not going to read. I start with the, you know, the introduction as follows. I'll tell you when I finish the introduction. You see, corruption, I say corruption is pervasive and endemic in Nigeria. It has been nurtured and sustained by perverse values dysfunctional institutions, bad governance, predatory rulers, greedy officials of corporate and public service organizations, and complicit and unenlightened citizens. For me, this seems to, to, to explain corruption in Nigeria. Is that what I think what we're saying, perverse values? Where did we get there? Once upon a time in a university, you have been given a degree, like you're going to get today, and they sell having found Worthy in character and learning. We still go through that rhetoric today. But the vice chancellor who is giving the certificate, the university that is giving certificate, is giving it simultaneously to a criminal in the names of honorary degree. So where, where, where the lesson of character as part of the learning? I've advocated my brother, can we just be honest and take away character? But even learning, I'm not sure people are learning. So. Why not just say, having attended or know this place, we are awarding you a certificate? <laughs> in fact, a colleague of mine has said that if on matriculation day, if you tell students they will graduate the following day, they will be very happy because they have no need for the knowledge. That the four years will compel them to stay is a waste of their time. That's why they don't come to class. So they need the certificate, they don't need the learning, they don't need your knowledge. So I think there is pervasive. Uh, in the perverse values that we have come to uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, embrace. In, my, in many Nigerian cultures, and you see that in institutions, when you are leaving home, your parent tells you, if you are not doing well, come back home, don't spoil our name. Don't spoil our name, come back home. But what do we hear today? They actually push you out and to do whatever is necessary and not to return home until you are successful. And successful means having money. So the, the value has been turned upside down. What happened? What happened? And I think basically there are fewer and fewer people wanting who are eager and willing to stand alone. People want to judge you by what you wear. They want to judge you by what you, you know, what you drive. They want to judge you by the house you live. Can you stand alone and say, this is what I'm going to wear and I don't care what your own evaluation is? I tell people, I said, many things we have missed. Clothing is covering nakedness. It's covering nakedness. And all the things we have to do to dress is, they are not part of God's design for it. It's just for you to close your nakedness and you must close it properly. Nothing more than that. Another example I gave is for the even misunderstanding of wedding in Christianity. I mean, this mosquito net has nothing to do with Christianity. This cut of mosquito wearing, uh, mosquito net wearing, it has nothing to do with Christianity. It's a Western culture. Christian marriage, I know I have Reverend uh, Okoye here, and I have pretender Reverend... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Pharmacy, Dr. Uh, O.T.V. But Christian marriage essentially is a man and a woman publicly declaring a union. That's all. That's all. But see our values about these things today. Marriage is no longer in focus. Wedding is in focus. I know the difference between them. Wedding is what happened on the day that people wed. Marriage is not important. So you invest in wedding, but not in marriage. So we have these perverse values that we must need. So when we're talking about corruption in Nigeria, 
I think turning it around is examining our values and how we lost it. The second one, of course, arising from these perverse values are dysfunctional institutions. Whatever institutions you establish, if you have perverse values, they, of course they don't produce necessary, uh, you know, expected or declared outcomes. So you find a police force that rather than enforce the law, break the law. You find politicians who are supposed to govern, rather than govern, they constitute themselves to organize criminals stealing election boxes. So institutions become very dysfunctional. Of course, all these result in bad governance. And of course, the leaders go into politics, they go into various institutions, and just will become a predator. That means they, you know, they, they prey on the people whom they are supposed to serve. And of course, resulting in that is you find greed being the driving force rather than service. So for me, also citizens accomplish it, either through an enlightenment or through you know, the same perverse values. In Nigeria, talking about corruption, successive governments express commitment to tackling corruption. There has been hardly any government since independence that did not say something about corruption. In the 1966 coup, was actually the primary justification was based on corruption. The coup of 1983, December, by Buhari, was, uh, no, uh, you know, which brought Buhari to power, was based on corruption. I think the only government that really didn't bother itself so much was uh, General Babangida. In fact, Abacha went and reinstituted, uh, reinstituted the uh, Buhari's uh, agenda. Buhari had why uh, war against the discipline, but Abacha had war against the discipline and corruption, which was actually made into a law. People don't remember today. There was actually a decree on war against the discipline and corruption. So we find that corruption is actually, you know, one of the recognized as a problem. But when people who are supposed to solve the problem get into power, they do otherwise. So it's not lack of recognition that we still have corruption as, as pervasive as we find it today. So the more we talk about corruption, the more it grows. So different, despite different measures by best government in country since independence, to tackle this problem, it continues to inflict unbearable toll on the people, institutional development, and security of Nigeria. In financial terms, for you know, since the start of civil rule in 1999, Several top government of public officials, including state governors. When I say state governor, I even remember that a vice president was indicted and was to be thrown from contesting an election before the court overruled. So, a former vice president, state governors, ministers, commissioner, legislature, and judicial officers, as well as chief team of corporate organizations, especially financial institutions, have been indicted of corrupt practices. The present government came to power in 2013 with a major campaign platform of combating corruption as one of its three key programs. Under this regime, several politicians, military and public service personnel have been arrested and charged to court. In financial terms, looting of trillions of naira have been traced to corruption by public officials in collusion with corporate executives in the country. But only few of the economically and politically influential people who were arrested and prosecuted since 2004 have been convicted of corruption. As cases dragged for years for reasons of lack of political will, lack of capacity, corruption, impunity, and dilatory tactics by senior lawyers. In fact, there are this group of lawyers they call Senior Advocate of Nigeria. I said, it should just change their name to Senior Advocate of Corruption. <laughs> because it is, once it's the corruption, you see them jumping and, you know, excited. In fact, one came out of a high court in Lagos with, you know, the late lawyer's gang and lay flat on the floor in front of the, you know, high court and say, I have defeated the FCC. I have defeated the FCC. Just last year, just last year, that's how we have been reacting to corruption. In financial time, of course, we know trillions, we are not talking of billions. Unfortunately, I think one of the things we don't quite appreciate the enormity of corruption in Nigeria is the limitation of our cultural numeracy. I've been asking people, I don't know any ethnic group in Nigeria that has a word for a million. 
Maybe you, 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 you tell me where we live. It has to say 200 in five places and in 10 places. In ten, and by the time they do the 10 rounds, everybody's tired. So it is not possible. And I think when we're talking of leadership as part of the approach, and this part of the discussion we've had with the uh, executive director, it doesn't make sense to Nigeria and say 500 billion. But let him or her know that his children could have gone to school, the best school possible globally. He and children could have had the best medical care and you know, good roads, even with 500 billion in his state. It begin to make sense to them. They begin to relate to it. So even presently, one of the problems is the facet of leadership is we have not come with a vision of how to communicate, how to communicate the you know the enormity and the consequences of corruption. We abstract to a lot of people. That's why I say one billion. The first thing that comes to his mind is I wish I had part of this money. I wish I had part of the money. And like I keep telling people, I challenge religious leaders. I said, in Nigeria, we have actually spiritualized corruption. We spiritualize it. So if I were employed and you know, appointed a minister today, after three months, my pastor would begin to wonder about my commitment if I have not come to church for Thanksgiving. It, 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 it would begin to say, ah, is it really, was he pretending, was he really committed before he had not given Thanksgiving? And what is Thanksgiving? You are supposed to come, you are supposed to have take money. Because why do you think the person who was a bloody teacher in university, suddenly after three months you have so much money that you come and thank God for? Except you're expecting that he should be corrupt, he should have money he's not entitled to. And of course, you, you, you encourage corruption through that, you know, that process. And I, 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 on the other side, our Muslim brothers are very practical. Christians are fairly abstract in their thinking and you know, activities. Our Muslim brothers are very practical. The man takes his own, immediately he gets uh, uh, 300 by 300 yards uh, house. He builds a mansion behind, he puts a small mosque at the entrance. And say, Allah Ganaka, I know you're a very greedy God, you're a very jealous God, I know you'll be looking at my own big house. Let's just take this small one at the entrance of Ganaka. So he shares it with God, he's with a small mosque at the entrance, at the entrance of the house. And he will invite people to come and witness. So he began to pray to the people uh, after giving God his soul. So we brought corruption even into our religion. And therefore, religion can be leaders are not providing the kind of value that we need to move ahead. So we need first to begin to communicate corruption in terms of consequences in a very different way. Then, of course, like I said, many people have been indicted. Those who are powerful never get convicted. Don't be deceived that EFCC is not effective. Every year, or when uh, Magu or anyone before him comes out and says, we have convicted 200 people this year, all of us wonder, when, how, who? They are actually convicting you and I who don't have anybody, who knows nobody, who cannot afford expensive lawyers. Yahoo, Yahoo boys are convicted on daily basis because they don't have advocates, you know, advocates to argue for them. So you find that in the fight of corruption, the real trend is not being addressed. So that is uh, my uh, basic introduction. And I end the introduction by saying the crisis in the country are primarily engendered and attracted by bad leadership and governance. Leadership deficit is the most critical factor responsible for endemic corruption and absence of effectiveness, effective measure to tackle it. Tackling corruption therefore requires good leadership with a vision of a democratic polity, efficient, responsive and accountable government agencies, develop economy capable of ensuring high standard of living for every citizen, and sustainable security of citizens, institutions, critical infrastructure. Such leadership must be able to articulate and communicate the vision and mobilize participation of citizens toward the realization and sustainability of vision of the vision. Countries like Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore that effectively tackled widespread corruption within a short period achieved defeat because of good leadership and leaders that prioritize public good and welfare over personal and parochial interests. And I think as we, as we look at leadership and corruption, we need not to think that it's not something that is possible. 
it is something that is possible. Now, what is the concept of leadership? For the graduates, I'm sure you've been exposed to various kind of definitions. I've just known that there are three ways that people have looked at uh, uh, you know, leadership. One, the first one was in, in, in development. People thought of leadership or leaders as born. They would say the person has no leadership attribute. It has no leadership trait. That was how the notion, concept of leadership started. Gradually, we move away from that concept of uh, uh, leadership uh, by genetic endowment into leadership can be trained. And I think that is one of the reasons why uh, Dr. Otibe had established uh, the center LSD, because it begins that leaders can be trained. Leadership can result from training, but of course, not everybody is trainable. I, I think that is the difference. Leadership can result from training, but not everyone is trainable. So that is the difference. It is not that you know it's acquired naturally. And not being trainable may not be because you, you don't have intellect. You will have PhD and you're a professor and you're not trainable in leadership. Like the case of the guy who was just uh, suspended from OAU, he was simply not trainable in leadership. He was trainable to acquire information, but he was not trainable in leadership. So it, it is not necessarily cognitive deficiency that you know, uh, stop people from being trained uh, in leadership. I think that's why we go to, again, value. What is it that drives your life? What is it that is important? What is it that motivates you? And that is, I think, some of the essence. And any leadership training must comprise a substantial amount of that. Again, we moved, of course, from uh, the notion of leadership, which is hierarchical, and that the leaders is at the top, at the top of hierarchy, and people now talk of what is called dispersed leadership or multi-layer leadership. That in any organization, leadership is not about the leaders or the management alone. Indeed, every level has its leadership. A good example which uh, uh, a police leadership uh, said is, you have, say, Nigeria police force. You have the IG. The IGP is supposed to be provide leadership for the entire force. When you go to the state, the commissioner of police is expected to you know, provide leadership. You go to the divisional level, the DPO is supposed to provide leadership. When you send three patrol officers on the highway, one of them is supposed to provide leadership for the remaining two. So leadership is dispersed through the organization and they are interconnected. But they look different in terms of scope and in terms of scale. Uh, one retired chief of defense staff used to joke uh, when he joked, he said, and I, I said, do you know what is happening in the military? He said, my brother, don't waste your time. The problem we have is, I used to see the detail when I was below. Now that I'm at the top, I see wider space, but I see less of the detail. And so any leader, if you do not connect about with the ground level, you miss the detail and concentrate on the wider one, and in the end, we're solving no particular problems. So leadership is also regarded as the, the spouse. So what are the competencies that uh, a leader who will, be, who will provide good leadership is supposed to have? A writer has identified, a, a, a recent study has you know, provided the following list. One is ethical behavior and integrity that generate trustworthiness. That is the constant, the most important um, attribute that people mention. Ethical behavior and integrity that generate trustworthiness. You cannot, you know, preach one thing and do something. I always tell people, the power that you have by law, by rules, is less potent than the one by moral authority. You can Treating your worker not to come late to office. You can give many queries. It will not work. But let them find out that you come to work five minutes to eight. Without you saying a word, nobody will want to be late. And if they are late, they come straight to your office to offer explanation why they are late. And this is the difference between rulers and leaders. 
Leaders depend on their moral authority, even when they have legal authority. Rulers depend on legal authority, and they pay no attention to moral authority. This is the difference between rulers and leaders. So we need the first mention, as I said, is ethical behavior. The next one is competence. Competence. Leadership cannot result from an indolent and incompetent person. Because even if he has vision, he does not know how to translate that vision into reality. He will be suffering from cataract. And then what he tries to implement will be blurred. So he must have ethical uh, behavior. He must be competent. The next thing is that he must be able to communicate effectively his vision and make them uh, you know, uh, become a shared vision and not his own vision again. If he becomes, if he can't communicate, it may be a good vision and then he stops. I give a practical example. Again, that's my interpretation. I may be right or wrong. When the present president came to power in 1984, actually the coup was December 31st, uh, but I think he became president January 1st. Many of the policies then, people argue whether they were draconian. I think the major trap he had, he was so committed to his vision that he didn't bother to explain it. And indeed, people who have supported him, the press, the intellectual, and the rest of them, they were the ones I suppressed because he thought they, had no, they were no use. And that was what led to his uh, short regime. But to find the other one, who of course had no vision that uh, was great, but he had communication strategy to talk to people. And people followed him sheepishly and instituted the, you know, the culture of corruption to the level with which we have it today. So communication is very important. Don't just think because what I think my vision is is good, and therefore I don't need to communicate very well. You need to trans, you know, uh, you know, transform your vision into common vision, into common vision, so that it will be, you know, implemented by the generality of members. Another one that is, you need competent decision making. You need competent decision making, and you also need participatory decision making in order to evolve and you know, provide good leadership. Another factor that I was identified was critical, creative, and strategic thinking. LSD, I think, this is one of the areas they try to uh, you know, focus on. Then, of course, you need to care for subordinates, including their welfare, career development opportunities, coaching, and mentoring. These are what are regarded as necessary skills or competencies that produce leadership. If you acquire them, you are likely to be able to intervene in situations that require disruption or in different ways. Again, people have talked about the various styles adopted by leaders or you know, leadership in organization. They talk about uh, transformational, which is LSD's own uh, mantra. People talk about traject, strategic, transactional, autocratic, task-oriented, bureaucratic, and tactical approaches. These are just different ways that leaders try to accomplish goals. Of course, some of them are effective, some are not effective. Now, we're talking leadership. This is the background of what constitutes leadership. How has corruption in Nigeria benefited from good or bad leadership? What is corruption itself? It's been vigorously defined. Again, I'm sure you get some the paper at some point. Um, but I think for Nigeria, we talk about corruption broadly in four categories when we talk about the manifestation. I think very often what dominates public discourse is bribery, embezzlement, and kickback. I think these are the categories that tend to dominate uh, you know, public discourse. And I think they are very important. But I think we leave out another form of corruption that is very dangerous and very destructive. That is nepotism. What do I mean by nepotism? It is the allocation of resources, employment, admissions, contracts, location of infrastructure services to associate relatives, members of one community, religious and ethnic groups, clubs, and so on, as favor without following due process and without regards to merit and equity. Why nepotism is important? If you take money away, you've taken resources away. 
But when you engage in nepotism, the first thing is that you weaken institution, which is worse than uh, you know when you take resources out of them. Because when you put an incompetent person in an office, the first thing he does is to destroy every competent person around him. Once he succeeds, he moves on to destroy the culture of the organization because he's unable to operate with those rules. He would not be able to operate because he found himself inadequate and in fact himself illegitimate and he destroyed. I tell you today, if we have major problems, even the financial corruption that we are so concerned about was in fact a product of widespread nepotism. I went to universities where vice chancellors were vice chancellors and were very confident. I, I think the the person who spoke from Ushua earlier uh, was talking about Ibadan. I'm sure again, uh, which said, I'm not going to ask you what said. But, and I, I have seen generational interaction. When he was saying, he said the next thing they'll be talking about said. My said, don't talk about your said, you have graduation. When you say you are you are the first thing, which hall did you live in? That, 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 that was my generation. Hall was the thing. Once you say somebody lives in a hall, we can all profile you. No matter how rascally you are, if you were put in Sultan Belo, you will become a gentleman. If you were raised by seven pastors, ordained men of God, if they put you in Zika and independence, you become a rascal. <laughs> you become a rascal. I was an independent. I'm proud of you. An independent. Because there will be no investor of Ibadan without independence. So I'll be, be too boring. <laughs> you will be too boring. You know, without it. So, you, you, you find that the, the, the whole thing about dealing with corruption in Nigeria, we need to focus on nepotism. Unfortunately, we actually have institutions that are supposed to deal with them, but many Nigerians misunderstand them. We misunderstand about uh, many government policies, and because we misunderstand them, we criticize them in a way that is not appropriate, and we give the operator of those ones to use them in a correct manner. I give you a, a, a few examples. Take, for example, when people don't get admitted, and if it's in a particular part, maybe in another part of the country, and the applicant is from the southern part, the first thing, you know, I don't get admitted because it's quota business. But it's because you don't understand the admission. The admission process gives 40% merit, 30% to catchment. Every state in Nigeria is a catchment to specified universities. So it is only the last 30% that is given to educationally disadvantaged states which incidentally is why more widespread than people know. It is about 19, state, 19 northern states and two southern states. So 21 states are actually tagged educationally disadvantaged. So it is not as beneficial of a small group as we thought. So, but when at least come out, they just blanketly, you know, condemn it. And what you get as a result of that those who are supposed to deal with the matter and be properly monitored are then ignored by those who have capacity to monitor them because you have said nothing good about it. I happen to come from the north, the old northern region. You couldn't get to Kevin College if we didn't have the first, you were not one of the first five candidates in the common entrance. It was the same common entrance all over northern Nigeria. The best five are taken to Kevin. Old boys, is destroyed. If you go to Kefi now, you can't get anything that looks like Kefi. Kefi was the intellectual house of the North. Most vice chancellors were produced by Koba. Most military were provided by Rewa. So there is always the idea that uh, Sadana will say, well, if you want some compromise in admission, you can go to Barewa, but not Kefi. But not Kefi. But today, Barewas are stronger and intellectual houses are not as potent. So that is a, was a quota system of five the best. Take unitary school. There was a debate about a week ago, and you know, the, and I, I, a number of people sent it to me, and I said, You people, you don't think. You call it unitary school, isn't it? It didn't say gifted children's school. So, unitary school means the purpose for establishing them is bringing people from all the states across Nigeria and boom them together that they see themselves as Nigerian. So, academic, you know, uh, performance at the entry point was not the sole representation. But yet, if you still go to that, I said, look at the state distribution. 
you will still find the state that you think is privileged actually do not have their share of uh, admission in those schools. So then Federal Character Commission. Federal Character Commission also was to ensure that there is equity. In fact, what they are supposed to use was to look at your state population. Your state population, if you represent 2.5%, to ensure that on average, you have 25 to 3% of the total federal appointments. That also was the idea of the Federal Character Commission. But what is it that Character Commission will do today? If you want to hire 50 people, they will bring their own 50 people. And we are not setting up machinery to monitor what they are really doing and how they are doing it because we have this generalized uh, condemnation of, uh, uh, you know, of those. And I think we need to monitor instances of nepotism more closely because I think they are also at the root. And I think that is the point where leadership is also important. A leader that goes to his home village and everybody there is brought to the Abuja is it's not a leader. It's a recruiter. <laughs> it's a recruiter. It's not a leader. I come from a state which you can't get employment in any federal establishment now. Because everywhere you go, we are overstaffed with our people. And my analysis was that what was happening, the people from my state have a habit of going to their village and bring cooks, be all kinds. So you find there is overrepresentation at the junior level whom they smuggle in in order to pacify their village people. But of course, not their people. I mean, they are human beings. They are Nigerians. You cannot complain that because you don't, we are not represented at the other level. Therefore, you are not represented. So I'm saying that nepotism is a corrupt part of corruption that we must monitor quite more seriously. In terms of anti-corruption measures, I think government have tried to introduce many measures. The common one is an establishment of investigation panel. Immediately there is an accusation or suspicion of this. A panel is established, they produce report. The report may be published or may not be published, may be acted or may not be acted upon. Then, of course, there is enactment of anti-corruption laws, establishment of anti-corruption agencies. One of the bulkiest, and I'm sure there are lawyers in the house, bulkiest uh, anti-corruption law, which Nigeria had forgotten, was actually Corrupt Practices Decree of 1975. It was a very bulky legislation passed during the Obasanjo, uh, Muritaba Obasanjo administration. It was actually done in Muritaba. Incidentally, that law was abrogated just before Obasanjo left office in 1979. Very bulky. Corrupt Practices Decree of 1975. I don't know whether he was at, I don't know what he did in those periods. I was afraid of the use of that law <laughs> after he left office. But I, I, when I think of it, it was interesting to me. So we are not sort of law. When he came back, he established the ICPC. ICPC was about public corruption. Our knowledge today is that we think that the worst corruption occurred in the public sector. But a report that was released was it last year, uh, Tabo Beki African Union report, showed that indeed corporate, uh, corporate behavior, corporate behavior of corporation actually accounted from 60 to 70 percent of illicit outflow of capital from Africa. Big companies come to Nigeria, we don't know what they are doing. And they, you know, they take a lot of money. Take the, the case of MTN and the Stanbic, it's not even the popular one you, you know, that between ITM and Stanbic Bank, they were remitting billions to South Africa. What is it? I come to Nigeria, I use that, you know, that your idea to develop a program in, uh, in Nigeria, but I credit it to my parent company in South Africa. And then, of course, I would say, because it was developed in South Africa, for the next 10 years, we'll be paying 10 billion for the use of that program. And then you transfer the, the money to, so you don't pay prof uh, money on it. So there are a number of these that are going on that we need to expand our understanding of corruption and the appropriate measure. But of course you need leadership that you know, can do that. What of impact of corruption? I do not need to tell you what it is. Look at what your educational system is today. Look at what your health system is today. Look at what your roads are today. Just think of any area, just of any area that 
is working. I think I give you from personal example. I once stayed in a hospital as a teenager for 48 days. And I didn't even know that we were going to stay in the hospital. I had neck pain and I woke up. That was local jail. And I, I woke up and I went to the hospital. After you know examination, the doctor said, Are your parents here? I said, No, I have a guardian. He said, How can I be rich? Luckily, the wife of my guardian was a ward attendant. I said, It's a ward attendant. And they, of course, uh, he talks about closing. They call her. And they call her and they said, This person is not going home. They said, What is it? They said, I have judges. I stayed there for 48 days. I was fed free. There was another person from the Kena Government Secondary School. He was also there much longer. In fact, I spent only 48 days only. Because we had bonded together, when he was living, I felt lonely and I felt better. In any case, I didn't knew I was that sick. It was doctor. So I now said, no, I will be lonely. Can I go? They said, well, since you are in town, there are no problem. When he was going, he was given a carton of glucose. In my own case, in order to continue to monitor me, I was to go to every week to collect a tin of glucose, which did for another two months. You I, you see that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we didn't have resources. This was 1968. We didn't have resources that we have today then. Until 1980, those of you who, somebody is from Kaduna, the, uh, the General Hospital in Kaduna, which was taken over by Montebello University, if you went there to collect glasses, they were plastic uh, frame. As long as you took plastic frame, after your you know uh, refraction and fitting, it was free. It was when if you needed psychedelic uh, frame, you pay for the psychedelic frame, but if not for the glasses. We didn't have all these resources. How come today all these have collapsed? How come? Because a few people have kidnapped the resources and left them poor. Unfortunately, if such people were arrested. We will buy a shoebi and follow them to court and say they are, you know, they are persecuting them on account of their ethnicity, on the basis of their religion, on the basis of political affiliation. The question you should ask anyone arrested for corruption is not whether ethnic group will be law. Ask the Jew do it. The Jew do it. That's the leadership you can provide in your community, in your family. So the Jew do it that I did it and you need to be protected by your ethnic group is not an escape. So we need again to begin to generate uh, some kind of narratives around that. Now, how do we then need to define, uh, you know, begin to, I need to round up now. If not, I'll violate my 30 minutes uh, <laughs> that you're not looking for me, but I know why you're listening to me. Deliberately, my voice is loud, so you think <laughs> you will not sleep. <laughs> so, if we want to combat corruption in Nigeria, what do we need to do? I think most important is political leadership. Political leadership that envisions effective anti-corruption measures. Heads and officials of government in all organs and levels should internalize ethical behavior. We are back to the ethical behavior again. Ethical behavior and provide strong signals for groups and organizations in society that the fight against corruption is necessary and is given prominence and priority in governance. When you establish even you come and say my program is anti-corruption, but agencies that are supposed to fight corruption are under resourced. Resourced in, in terms of resources and in terms, in terms of human resources, in terms of financial and material resources. That does not suggest, indeed, you have a program. It does not suggest you have a program. So we need a political leadership. We also need leadership. Leadership, like I said, leadership is not just at the political level. We need especially leadership at the social level. There is this uh, you know, uh, analytical approach to corruption that will deal with corruption you must understand the three plans, the society, the system, and sanctions. The society provides the motivation, provide motivation for corruption. The system provides the opportunity for corruption. Sanction deter corruption. So you must bring all of three together. Apart from political leadership, I think we need leadership at social level, beginning from the family, beginning from the family. 
the families are in disarray. They are in disarray. And disarray is says not that they are you know there is divorce, but there is so much materialism in within family that people, children are raised with the wrong uh, uh, ideas apart from society. And then of course, we also need leadership at cultural level. When there are annual cultural festivals and the rest of them, who are those who get recognized? Who are those who get recognized? My university some years ago was to give honorary degree. And uh, one of the people mentioned was a corrupt person whose name was in the press. Everybody talking about him being corrupt, being corrupt, being corrupt. And I had become notorious in the Senate. And I, when I was living, I remember the Buhari era where people said, you know, padlock on your mouth. So I said, whatever happened today, I'm not going to talk. I will just attend Sai Register. And we got there, they mentioned this name. I said, I'm not going to talk. After all, everybody knows that uh, the reputation of the university is not my reputation. <laughs> then the, the next topic, the next topic, but three topics after that, something just hit my heart and said, when we are reading this minute at the next Senate, and they say, this nomination was unanimous, can you live with it? I tried to, to try to rub out of it. The thing came pounding. So I raised my hand feebly. Uh, the vice chair did not recognize. After some time, I did register point and said, uh, well, you know, and then he wants to say something. He said, oh, okay, what is it? So I apologize. I actually started. I said, I apologize very, very profusely. I was actually here when this issue was taken. I know we've gone far past it. It's been adopted. But this is what is pounding on my heart, that I do not agree with the nomination. I'm not asking you to, do, to change it. All I'm asking you is to just show that I objected to the nomination. And I said the candidate in person, I've not met him in my life. I have no ambition of meeting him. And I pray God will never bring circumstances that will meet. So there was nothing personal about it. You won't believe it. Before I sat down, if I mention some of the name, uh, Professor Kuna will know God's got on. If somebody was in attendance, was in attendance, was medical director, because he's not a member of Senate. And he said, sir, actually I was surprised when the vice chancellor says he's been awarded because the person has done a lot for the university. He said, the person is from this state. And of course he was elected to go and do exactly that. So why do you pay him twice for what uh, he's supposed to be doing? Before he sat down another person, this thing was literally overturned until when a psychiatrist professor, a lot of you are psychology, I don't Psychology and psychiatrists, the most of them are normal, you know, practitioners. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why there is, you know, in doing their course outline, they have a course called abnormal psychology. <laughs> so, and the guy just got up and said, I don't know why this state is always in Dr. Professor Lemika each time he gets up. We know it's one of the senior professors in the city, and therefore we are part that. Of course, people, the this just and they say, Yes, you are right, and let's go on. The man was brought in, he promised them 30 million. Wrote four months later and said, those 30 million, he actually going to execute three boroughs on campus. Yes. A year later, I was in the vice chancellor's office for something else. One of the younger chap was at the said, he said, sir, you said you didn't know this person. He said, no, I don't, I don't believe you. I said, what happened? Oh, he said, the man, this is what happened.